set it really low, all right? Because <laughs> uh, I'm not used to this kind of thing. Uh, and there's, there's a story in the Bible about Balaam who, who actually God had to use a donkey to talk through to get to this guy's attention. So I figured if God can use an, I mean, a donkey to talk, he can speak through me too. So the question I want to answer today, it's been kind of on my mind, on my heart, is how good do you have to be to be in ministry? And I don't mean like full-time paid ministry. We're all really jacked up. I mean like everyday ministry. As a Christian, we're all called to be in ministry, right? But how good do you have to be to start serving, to, to step out, to, to help someone else? Because if you're anything like me, you know how jacked up you are. You don't need to, anyone to tell you that. And, and we often take ourselves out of it before we even realize what God wants to do. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Last week, Pastor Joel talked about the gift within you and that the world needs that gift. And it's so scary. Sometimes it's the most scary thing in the world to actually just step out and give the world our gift. We'll do everything else. And then we realize that God wanted to use that gift that we've been passionate about the whole time, right? But the man who said those words to Timothy, he, he, he talked about that verse where Paul was encouraging Timothy, a younger man, to fan into flame, to, to, to get those embers burning, to fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. Paul, the guy who said that to Timothy, had a pretty crazy start in ministry. And... Uh, my wife was reading our kids the Bible the other day. My wife, Hillary, right here. She's the most amazing mom in the world, among other things. She's incredible. She's an incredible woman. And one of the very best things about her, her, her motherhood is she not only just takes care of our kids all the time, feeds them, clothes them, cleans up after them, all those things, but she, she's constantly just in the moment, just inputting their, into their hearts spiritual truth in the, in the Word. And we try to read the Word to our kids every, every night before they go to bed. And I was just listening to her read this story about Paul. <clears throat> and I thought to myself, how in the world did they let him preach so soon after all the stuff he did? Because this guy was like responsible for Christians getting killed. Like, this was no small thing. I mean, anyone in here done that? Okay, good. Don't, don't raise your hand. We don't need to see that. Um, but this was the account in Acts 9, 17. I'm going to start just by kind of giving you the, what happened here. So Ananias was, was called to go give Paul back his sight because he saw Jesus and he was blind for several days because, because of that encounter with Jesus that changed his life forever. And then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul, who is Paul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales from, fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. Wait, he didn't go to Bible school for five years before that? At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And here's how much his life had changed. After many days had gone by, not years, not months, after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. So now the guy that was trying to kill these Christians or have them get killed is the one they're hunting now because his change was that radical and that fast. And he was, people were still scared to even let the, him come into their church and he was preaching about Jesus. That's how fast he started doing ministry because the second that we change the second that we get transformed by Jesus, we can't help but tell other people about it. So my wife was reading this story to our kids, and I'm just thinking to myself, how in the world did they let this guy preach so soon? How did they let him into, even into a church? But that gift that he had, he, he started fanning it into flame instantly. He had no ministry experience. He had a lot of schooling, but it wasn't ministry schooling. It was probably, he probably had the, equivalent of a couple doctorates 
in our day, but he, he had no ministry experience. He wasn't doing this because he had gone to seminary for five years and, and got a doctorate in that. He, he just went right into it. And he ended up being one of the most influential people in the whole world and writing a whole bunch of the New Testament. So as Joel would say, here's what I know about you. <laughs> you probably don't feel good enough to serve. You probably don't feel talented enough to maybe be up here on the stage or do whatever God's calling you to do. You're ashamed maybe just to even walk in here to church after what happened last night. Or on the way to church, if you're anything like me, sometimes on the way to church, you're screaming at your kids. <laughs> or maybe this last week you had a fight with your spouse. And you're thinking, how in the world do I speak into someone else's marriage if I can't get my own marriage together? And you're thinking to yourself, how could I minister to these kids that come to church if I can't even be a good parent myself? And you're taking yourself out of the game before you even start. You're thinking to yourself, if I can't get my life together, how could I ever help anyone else get their life together? I wonder what would have happened if Paul would have done that. Because let me tell you, when he started preaching, he didn't have his life together yet. I mean, he saw Jesus and was transformed from the inside out, just like you and me when we accept him into our hearts. But he was still messed up. <laughs> so the only three things I could think of when, when answering this question, obviously, there's no goodness that we have of ourselves to do any ministry. It's, it's all him, right? But three things that I thought of. One, proximity to Jesus proximity to Jesus. The closer we are to Jesus, the more effective we will be in life and ministry to others. Our whole life is a ministry. Our parenting, our spouse, our friends, it's not just here in church. Our whole life is a ministry. And the closer you are to Jesus, the more, the more proximity you have with Jesus, the more effective you'll be. <clears throat> There's absolutely no substitute for this. And I feel this all the time. The closer I get with Jesus, the more time I spend with him. And it's, it's not, you know, like with a marriage relationship, it's not like, oh man, I feel distant from my spouse. I'm just going to get close to them real quick. Like you can't, you got to spend time with them. You got to create, you got to curate that relationship for a long time. And the people that you see are so effective in ministry, they've been curating that relationship for a long time. So the more effective we can be, and Jesus doesn't need you to, to wait till you, you get to some place to where you're, you start ministry. Just get close to him, right? Just start. Just start. Today's the day. Just start. And it's a relationship that has to be fostered every single day. Um, my wife loves animals. She didn't know I was going to talk about her so much this, this morning, but she loves animals. She's actually a high-class puppy breeder. So if any of y'all need expensive dogs, we've got some. Um, <laughs> but I've, I've been accused of not being a dog lover so much. And the truth is, I actually really do love dogs. I really do love dogs. I just don't love the smell of dogs all the time. You know what I'm talking about? Like when you, and we have golden retrievers, so they're great. They're super fluffy. They're amazing. They're always wanting to hug you and kiss you and all that stuff. You know, but then you, you pet the dog, and then you bring your hand up to your nose, and you're like, oh. And you got to wash your hands like 12 times, right? Live so close to Jesus that you start to smell like him. You'll start talking like him. You'll start looking like him. Like that old married couple you know that starts looking like each other. How does that happen? You know, you know what I'm talking about. And I notice that the personal, my personal life, my thinking will start to change if I start to spend time with Jesus. If I start curating that relationship with him. It's not like he ever left. It's like that, that old couple that was, that was sitting in their, their truck seat. You remember the old trucks that had the, the bench seat in the front, Right? And people in love would always scoot to the middle, right? And uh, the, the, the old lady goes to her husband. They're driving down the road, and there's a truck in front of them, and then they can see the two heads right next to each other, you know, the, the, the gals in the middle seat cuddling up to her, to her husband. And, and she's like, man, we used to do that. Where, where did the fire go? You know, we used to do stuff like that all the time. We used to, I used to cuddle with you in the front seat. And he's sitting there driving. I ain't the one who moved. <laughs> And that's, that's God doing it. Like, he never, he never ran away from us. We're the ones that go, if 
far away from him, right? We're, we're the ones. And if I just take that time with him every day, I start to think differently. And often, you know, I've got the Bible app on my phone. Do you all have the Bible app on your phone? If you don't, get it. It's amazing, right? You can listen to the Bible. I, I do a lot of driving in my work. And so sometimes I'll get behind, like when I'm at home and I'm busy, and I've got that, like, read the Bible in a year plan that takes three years to finish. Anyone with me there? <laughs> and then I'll get behind several days, and so I'll start, to, I'll start to just listen and just catch up, and sometimes spend like 45 minutes, and I have to make myself, before I listen to any podcasts or any music, I got to, you know, get back up to the day I'm supposed to be in my Bible app, and sometimes I'll listen to four, five, six days of lamentations all at the same time, you know, and I've got this friend Ray, you know, on the Bible app, you can have friends see your activity on the Bible, and my, my wonderful friend Ray, he always, he always sees it, and he'll like your Bible activity, right? So it's, he knows that I'm catching up on my Bible reading because it's like, Ray, liked your activity, liked your activity, like, you know, because I went through four different chapters in one day. But when I spend time with Jesus, when I just spend time hearing him, listening to him, praying with him, worshiping him, I start acting like him, I start thinking like him. And I think a lot of us are scared. I know I am that when I start acting more like Jesus, maybe the world will think I'm a weirdo. And we are called to be peculiar people. We are weird. Yes, sir. But last time I checked, when we live like Jesus, I think people will want to be around us. When was the last time you didn't want to be around someone who had the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. I think that's the kind of people we want to be around. And we'll become more attractive to the world if we spend time with Jesus. Because we'll start to be like him. Why do you think crowds followed him all the time? Because he knew, they knew he loved them. So proximity to Jesus is the most important thing. In Acts, they say, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. That's amazing. The other thing is just to live in the light. John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. What does this look like to live in the light? What does he mean? To me, that means be real. Don't act like you're better than you are. And don't put on a front because we all know that we're all messed up. And I was scared to death. I'll be honest with you. I was scared to death to be in full-time ministry because I know my own thoughts. I know my own heart. I know my own anger. I know my own proneness to sin. And I am not qualified to do this. This scares me because I'm messed up. And what if I fall like so many famous pastors have? People put them up on this pedestal and they let everybody down. Well, maybe we shouldn't have put them on a pedestal to start with. We, go, we get all shocked. It's like, oh my goodness, they're human. <laughs> Wait a second. And a song came out of that, that that was on our last series. I don't want to be in the palace like, like David was. I don't want to be sipping wine. Lord, if I'm going to be in the battle, I want to be on the front line. Because as Christians, you and I, we're always in the battle anyway. And that's what God showed me. It's like... I don't want to think for one second that just because I'm not up here in ministry or, or helping other people that I'm not in ministry anyway. As Christians, we're all in this battle. So we might as well be on the front line. And let me tell you, you're on the winning side. So don't worry about it. Amen. We watched a show that was set before the Revolutionary War and, the, and they were... This person had gone back in time and they were seeing what, what was about to happen and they knew which side was going to win, right? And back then they thought England was going to win, but these people knew better because they had gone back in time and the decisions they made were completely different because they knew they were on the winning side. What would that look like if we always knew that we were on the winning side? Let me tell you, you can't get found out if people already know all your mistakes, right? The only time that it gets dangerous is when we start living a lie and, and pretending that we're something that we're not. And I'm, I'm, I'm standing up here in front, of, in front of you as a messed up person, 
And so when you, if, if you ever go to someone and say, man, he's messed up, I'm like, yeah, I know. There, there's no finding out when people already know. And I'm not saying to go find everybody you know or go put all your sins on Facebook. But in James, he says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. When we confess our sins to Jesus, we find forgiveness. But when we confess our sins to other people, trusted friends, we find healing. And for some of us, that's just all we need to do. We just need to be honest with someone. And, and like I said, it's not everybody. But find some trusted friends that aren't going to go gossip about you and go tell them. Tell them everything. I've got a guy named Carlos. We'll sit down at Bill Miller's on a Monday morning over coffee and tacos. And we'll just lay it all out there. And he's never surprised. He's never like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you had that thought. He's like, how's that working out for you? (laughs) Find yourself a friend like that, that you can tell everything to. Because when we can live in the light, when we can be real, then there's nothing that can stop us because we have nothing to lose. And as we open up to that small group of people, we start to find healing. And as we start to heal, we can open up to more people about our story of forgiveness and healing. And as we open up our story, let me tell you, God does not want to waste your sin and your shame. He will not waste it if we give it to him. Sometimes I feel like we go into church feeling like we have to give God only our best. And God's like, no, I want those broken pieces over there. I want all of you, not just your best. And when we start to do that, when we start to live in the light and be real with people, then he can use our story, our own sin, our own shame, our own mistakes, our own problems to help someone else. Because there's like four or five different problems that we all deal with. So if, if, if you're in the lie right now that the enemy's telling you, and trust me, I've been there, where you feel like you're the only one dealing with the sin or addiction or problem that you have, that is the biggest lie there is. Because there's like four or five different things and we all struggle with them. So I guarantee you, if you're feeling that way, there's someone else in this room right now that's feeling the exact same way. And when we start to open up, it's like, wait, you too? Yeah. And that's when the healing comes. And that's where the power is. So don't wait till you've got it all together to start serving. Start serving in order to get it together. Because when you start to serve in the church, when you start to get around the group of people, I've seen it time and time again. What happens when we start serving is we start to get around the right kind of people that also are serving and also love Jesus, and we start to change from the inside out. It's incredible to watch. Number three, find something you're passionate about and just start doing it. How hard is that? It wouldn't seem like it is, but it can be because it's scary as all get out. I'll tell you what, in Romans, Paul says, we have different gifts. I love this. But according to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. With your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. That's mine. I love to tell people how awesome they are. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. We all need each other so bad. Because while I may be able to give you encouragement, maybe I need a word from the Lord from you. Or maybe someone else needs hospitality or generosity. And God's put that in each one of you. As I was saying those things, you probably identified with one of those things. Like, hey, that's, that's what I love to do. And he'll take the very thing that you're passionate about and you love and he'll use it for his kingdom. And you'll get to be a part of a team of, of, of people that are doing the same thing. We can change Seguin in the name of Jesus. For Jesus. And that thing that you're passionate about, you want to be really good at it, don't you? Like, I'm really passionate about music, if you haven't been able to tell yet. I will do just about anything to go play music. And I've often heard it said in the church that, well, you know, we don't want to be too good. Like, worship shouldn't sound like a concert. Last time I checked, thousands of people go to concerts. And if we can give them the word of the Lord, why wouldn't we? Or it shouldn't sound, it shouldn't be entertainment. You know, the definition of entertainment is to hold someone's attention 
I hope we can hold attention. Look at the best architecture, the best art, the best music, the best movies. Some of the best art in the world has been made by Christians in the church. Look at the Sistine Chapel. Did it for Jesus. Some of the hymns we all love, those are written for Jesus. Those are written by believers. The best architecture, the best music, the best movies, the best business people, the best politicians, the best art in the world has and should come from the church. Music, I believe, is worth doing because music, art in any form is communication that goes beyond words. It's communication of a story. I play in a country band and we tell real stories about all kinds of things. And I believe that that has value, right? But in the church, we have the best story to tell in the whole world. Why wouldn't we tell it in the best possible way? So that passion that's inside you burning, we need it. The world needs it. What would this world look like if everyone saw that the very best workmen and women, the best scholars, the best teachers, the best musicians, woodworkers, pilots, truckers, plumbers, contractors, you name it, were Jesus followers? What if the world knew that? Because we do it with a purpose. So if you get one thing out of today, I want it to be this next thing. Don't take yourself out of the game. You may be scared to death right now because you know that there's something burning in you that you want to use for God. And I don't know what that thing is. There's so many ways to, to serve and give of our time and our talents and our passions. But there's something burning inside you and you want to do it and you're scared to death. Don't take yourself out of the game. Abraham Lincoln said, you cannot fail unless you quit. <clears throat> Another quote. He said, start now. Start where you are. Start with fear. Start with pain. Start with doubt. Start with your hands shaking. Start with voice trembling. But start. Start and don't stop. Start where you are with what you have. Just start. Some motivational plaque I saw on Amazon. Let me tell you what, ministry is messy. And that's why it's so scary, because we're dealing with people, and we know how messed up we all are. Greeting new people over there in the lobby every week is scary when they come in the door. Playing and singing up here on stage is frightening. Isn't it, Emily? <laughs> the teaching the kiddos over there can be exhausting, but guess what? It's also insanely rewarding. You know, besides my wife, they, they say that it takes a, a community to raise kids. And this is the community that, that, that we've chose. And besides my wife and I trying to pour into our kids every day, we say our kids go across. And Miss Patty, if you haven't met her, she's one of the most incredible teachers and leaders I've ever seen. And those people that she raises up, those kids get the gospel every single Sunday when they're in here. And sometimes that's the only break my wife gets all week. And it's incredible when they come out with those papers and the verses that they've learned. My little three-year-old, Elliot, if you know Elliot, he's a fireball. And he was up at like 7.30 the other morning. I have no clue why. He's down in the kitchen and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make the coffee in the morning. And he just goes, Dad, did Jesus die for us? I said, yeah. It's like, where did that come from? Well, maybe it's because of the kids ministry workers are telling them that kind of stuff. And it just implants it in their head and their heart and they'll never forget it. I still remember being in nursery and church. It's scary, it's messy, but it also brings you life and it's insanely rewarding. It also gets your mind off of your problems and yourself. And if you step up to the plate guess what? There's a chance you're going to hit the ball. But if you never step up, there's no chance. And you'll always leave yourself wondering what could have been. And we'll, I believe we'll start going the moment we convince our hearts that the risk of giving up is greater than the risk of stepping out. Because it's scary if we step out. We might fail. 
but we definitely will fail if we don't, if we don't use our gifts. There's so many easy ways to jump in. And you may feel like this is really hard. Like, how do I do this? I don't know. You know, maybe you see those cameras back here. I don't know how to work a camera. Well, guess what? We didn't either a few months ago, and we're just figuring it out as we go. But why don't you come along with us? And, and uh, Carrie, a dear friend of mine, is the head of our tech department. I saw him the other day. He just invited one of our students named Deverick, and, and he just he had some time in the afternoon, and Carrie said, come on, just hang out with us, figure it out. And um, it was incredible to watch. Just and, and, and now Deverick's like an integral part of our tech team because he just took the time to say, hey, why don't you come out for the afternoon? Maybe you think, man, I'm a programmer. I don't know what to do. Speaking of Carrie, not too long ago, there was a piece of equipment we needed for, it was several thousand dollars and we didn't have the budget for it. And he went and wrote the programming for some little thing called a Raspberry Pi. Anyone know what that is? Anyway, he made it work just by writing code. You think, I'm a code writer. How do I do that in church? Guess what? There's plenty of places to do that in church. Maybe, maybe you're a welder. We got a guy named Ivan who's an incredible piano player, and he's also a welder. That's what he does for a living. And he just made the speaker, these, these big, uh, I don't know what they're called anyway, <laughs> to hold our speakers up in the, in the gathering place over there. He just took raw metal and he made it using his gifts for Jesus. Maybe you, maybe you love children. Heck, the people, maybe, maybe you think, I, I don't know how to do anything. I can make coffee, though. Those people probably do more ministry than any of us. It's <laughs> the reason I'm awake right now. They're incredible people. There's people back behind the wall. James, he runs our live stream, our broadcast for people who can't be here. Gets the word out. He brought his son this morning because his wife isn't feeling well, and he, he brought him. He was here at 7.30 in the morning with his little son. Drove all the way here just to serve. It's incredible what these people do. There's so many ways to jump in, and it's an incredible team. It's an incredible family. So I'm going to invite you however you can. There's so many easy ways to do it. Go to the Welcome Center afterward, right back here, and just tell someone what you're interested in. Maybe it's something you're not seeing happening around here, and you're like, I don't know if I could use it. Well, guess what? If it's something you're not seeing happening, maybe God's calling you to step up and do it. Uh, you can email us from the website. That little connect that my wife said you can hover your phone over the QR code. It's a high technology thing, you know, and you go to the Connect. You can write anything you want in there. Just go, hey, I'm interested in serving in whatever ministry you're feeling right now. And they'll get back to you. Write it on a napkin or a piece of paper and throw it in the offering box on your way out. However you can, just jump in. Talk to one of us. Find a way to jump in. Step up. Because this world, this church, this community, this family needs you. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this passion that is burning inside all of our hearts right now, and it's different for each one of us, but there's something that you're calling us to, and we just want to answer that calling and say, yes, Lord, I'm going to step up. I'm going to be there, and for those that are, are, are feeling that right now, feeling your voice, give them that little nudge like, hey, it's time to get out of your seat and go step up and do something. Give them courage right now because it's hard. It's scary. Give them the tenacity to just go make that first step, that first connection, just to start. And if you're here maybe for the first time or maybe you've been coming for a while and you don't know this Jesus on a personal level that we're talking about, now is your chance to start that relationship. And it is just that. It's not a religion that we talk about here. It's not all these do's and don'ts and this list of things. It's a relationship with your creator and the one who made you. And if you need to start that relationship right now, I want to invite you in that just by talking to him from your heart, honestly. And we're all going to say these words together. They're no magic words, but if you mean them and say them from your heart, God's going to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light and give you an eternal home in heaven when you die. So all of us, can you just just say these words with me. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for dying for me. I believe that you rose again from the dead to prove that you were God. And with the faith I have right now, 
I choose to believe that you are who you say you are. Forgive me all the things I've done. Give me a new start. Give me a fresh slate. And change me from the inside out. And I want to live for you forever. Thank you for my life that you've given me. Thank you for new life. And thank you for the home in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.